Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of What's on Graft. I'm your host, Tom, and today we are going to be exploring the wonderful world of caffeine, coffee, and of course, coffee beer. And to do that, we are traveling back to the lovely city of Nashville, Tennessee. If you've been following season three of our show, you'll remember our Haze Craze episode with Bearded Iris Brewing in Nashville. IPA has kind of like experienced so many trends within the style itself that the idea of not making a classic IPA was nothing new by any means. It just wasn't called like New England IPA at the time. Nashville is a vibrant place with a very exciting food and drink culture. They even have a sake brewery, which is usually a good sign. But they are also home to some amazing coffee roasteries. With my trademark charm and bribery, I convinced a local organic roastery to let me shadow their handsomest employee during a roast day. So when this hits 400, then it's ready. First roast today is Columbia. Today in Bongo Java, we're fulfilling orders for customers all over the country. I get a lot of questions of, from people asking like if our coffee was grown in Tennessee, or like how local it is. Nah, the, the closest I can tell you is in Mexico. It's called the Bean Belt, so between the tropics, but basically that's where you can grow coffee in the world. And so Puerto Rico and Hawaii are just within that limit, and like Florida and California are just too high. Speaking of Hawaii, did you know What's on Draft's season three finale will take place there? Be sure to check out our special two-part finale episodes filmed on location in Maui and Oahu, respectively. Spared no expense. Now back to the coffee episode. Puerto Rico doesn't really have any, they don't really produce anything to any significant extent. And Hawaii, it's just overpriced because it's American coffee. I mean, it's, it's good, it's good coffee. Just like your local brewery, everybody wants their hometown coffee. Well, not everybody. While coffee has been around for thousands of years, roasting large quantities is a relatively new practice. But these large-scale roasting techniques and tools haven't evolved much since their inception. I mean, this is, what, a 60-year-old machine, 70-year-old machine? And the only thing that's really changed is a lot of them are automated now. The materials they use are different. Like, most of them are steel and aluminum not really cast iron and like the collar is cast iron and a lot of the components are and the way it holds the heat roasts tend to go a lot faster than on the newer machines back in the 1860s they would just bring in coffee to the harbor and it'd be green like this and you'd buy it by the pound or the ounce or whatever it was and people just roasted coffee at home on campfires or on the stove it was a big deal when like maxwell house started selling roasted coffee when places actually started brewing coffee that was a whole nother level. Coffee and beer go hand in hand, as evidenced here in the Modern Times Tasting Room in San Diego. But Californians aren't the only original thinkers to come up with the idea to combine the two beverages. So every year, fall or winter, we roast coffee for different stouts, coffee stouts for local breweries. We've done it for Fat Bottom, for Yazoo, and a couple times for Jackalope, and Jackalope is the one that ordered it again this year. They have a stout called Snowman Stout. I think they get Caldies. It's one of the roasts I actually have to do today, the Caldies dog. I mean, as far as I know, they're probably the second best known brewery in town. They were one of the first breweries to get their cans in like the grocery store and to get behind a lot of the bars and restaurants in town. I'm pretty sure they only do the Snowman Stout seasonally. I like Jackalope's lineup a lot. Now, the idea of making coffee beer might be confusing because as some of you may know, caffeinated alcoholic drinks are illegal in the United States. In 2010, the American Food and Drug Administration decided that certain types of alcoholic beverages that also contain caffeine are illegal. Now, this ban mostly affected sugary, caffeine-overloaded drinks like Four Loco, which used to contain the same amount of caffeine as three cups of coffee per can. However, there was one craft brewery that was caught in the crossfire of this caffeine ban called New Century. They were actually forced to close in 2011 because their flagship beer called Moonshot contained caffeine. Now, there's quite a bit more to New Century's closure that's briefly outlined in the 2009 documentary Beer Wars, but suffice to say, caffeinated beer is technically illegal in the United States. So, 
how is coffee beer legal? Well, the short answer is that since the caffeine in coffee comes from the chemical occurring naturally in the beans themselves, as opposed to artificially adding pure caffeine to a beer, coffee is not considered to be artificially caffeinated. And while the actual caffeine content in a coffee beer varies based on a number of factors, including how much coffee is added and when, the actual caffeine content in the final beer tends to be very low. In fact, many coffee beers don't have any caffeine in them at all. So, now that we've established we're not breaking any laws, let's proceed. As Tom continues to roast beans for Jackalope's special brew, he explains that brewers don't tend to be interested in roasts or varieties with overly complex flavor profiles. It's kind of the same reasoning that like chefs use in their restaurants, is you don't particularly want a dynamic coffee because you don't want competing flavors. You want, you want the coffee to taste like coffee, you know, like a red table wine. You don't want it to be overly complicated. You want it to just complement whatever else it's pairing with. It does still have a lot of dynamism. It's got a, an Ethiopian coffee in it, which Ethiopians tend to have really strong fruit and floral notes, and that still comes through in the qualities. With roasting complete, these coffee beans were almost ready to be introduced into the beer. All that remained was to grind them. After the coffee was completely ready, I followed it to Jackalope the next day to see it all come together. A batch of snowman stout had been brewed before I arrived, and with fermentation complete, they were ready to add the cold brew. But before that was to happen, QA procedure demanded a coffee taste test. Yeah! After flavor approval, the final mixture was then carbonated and packaged, and I got to drink it. It was smooth, balanced, and delicious, not cloyingly sweet or overly bitter like some coffee stouts. This cold brew method seems quite effective, and Tom Valentine is inclined to agree. But I think by far the most balanced and, and this is probably screwing up the audio, but the most balanced final product is if you're using a cold brew. You're just literally introducing another ingredient into the final product, so you're not screwing up either the coffee brewing or the beer brewing process. You're just adding something to it. But Tom is just a handsome coffee expert with beautiful eyes and a kind smile. He's never even made beer before. So I asked Modern Times' Morgan Tenwick what method they use for coffee beers back home in San Diego. Do you have any insight on the best ways or your favorite ways to combine beer and coffee? Like coffee and drinking a beer? Like Just one in one hand, one in the <laughs> yes. other hand? That's the best way to do the it? Uppers and downers? Yeah, we've always done, we do our, the Black House. We do a co couple coffee beers, but we're always whole bean, mm -hmm. cold steep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I think that's what they do here. Yeah. Oh, so they're, so we're on the right well, track. That's clearly then. the best way to do it. Yeah, clearly the best way. If that's how you guys do it, then that's I'm the totally best way to unbiased, do it. but. Yeah. <laughs> Ebulition's brewers clearly agree with Morgan's unbiased assessment of San Diego coffee beer techniques. At a beer tasting event we covered earlier this season at Project Bar and Grill, they debuted a coffee beer made with the same method. The next beer coming up, coffee stout. We call it the general. It has not just the coffee, but it's got roasted pinion pine nuts from New Mexico. The general was a big hit at this tasting and remains a core beer of ebullition to this day. There are many ways of incorporating coffee into beer, but the two most common seem to be steeping whole beans in the beer, which I'll call the San Diego method, since Modern Times and Ebulition Brew Works both use that method for their coffee beers. And the other method seems to be making a cold brew and then adding that to the finished beer after fermentation, which I guess we'll call the Nashville method, since that's what Jackalope used for their coffee beer. Now this begs the question, which method for introducing coffee into beer is best? And that's where you come in. Next time you're in an independent tasting room drinking a delicious coffee beer, ask them how they put the coffee in. Maybe it's the Nashville method, like our friends at Jackalope, or maybe it's the San Diego method, like Ebullition Brew Works here. Although if you say San Diego method and Nashville method, they won't know what you're talking about because I just made that up. Uh, maybe it's some other method altogether. Maybe they put used coffee filters in a randall. Maybe the bartender sensually caresses you with coffee grounds while you drink your beer. The possibilities are literally endless, so get out there and do this important research. Do it for me. And don't forget to leave a comment below with your favorite, I'm just kidding. We don't, we don't do that. We don't. See you next time on What's on Draft. Cheers. Yeah.